Next, our next speaker is Mike Miller, and he's going to look at the uh, subject of breakover to show the complexity it holds. He's a Huntsville, Alabama farrier and also an uh, emergency room uh, physician. And he's going to take a look at the in-depth look at the biomechanics, the anatomy, and the history and, and breakover and its function in regard to the horse's gait. Let's welcome Michael. Michael? Thank you, Frank. First, I want to thank Frank and uh, Jeremy for inviting me here. And uh, as they used to say on uh, a program, I can't remember the name of it, you heard Mitch now for something completely different. And you better check your preconceptions at the door because uh, I hope what I'm going to do is confuse you slightly, but I really want you to think about the terminology that you've been using because everyone in this room has been told about breakover from the time that you were a farrier student, an apprentice, you worked with a mentor, you were told, move the breakover here, slow it down, speed it up, put it over there. It's like moving a piece of furniture around. Sometimes when I give this talk, I ask people to stand up at the microphone and define breakover for me. And people are reluctant to stand up in a big crowd, so I won't do that today, but I think you all understand. Everyone in this room has an idea, and they're convinced that they know what it is. And first of all, what you think it is probably doesn't exist at all. I know it does not exist in groundhogs. I just thought of this this morning. I wanted to ease your minds about it since it's Groundhog Day. All right. Now, the problem with focusing on breakover or putting a rolled toe shoe, rocker toe shoe on uh, diagonal break over shoe is that it's taking your attention away from what really matters, which is a very complicated biomechanical animal weighing about 1,000 or 1,100 pounds for the average sport horse who's applying tremendous forces and you're working at the end of a long chain. So Thinking that your shoe is going to alter this chain of events drastically might be a little misguided. You do have an effect on what we're doing, but it might not be what you think it is. All right, what you see depends on where you stand. What, where I see, because where I stand, is because of my grandfather, A.C. Miller. He spent his life as a machinist and ornamental metal worker and multiple generations back in my family. And I don't know why this is probably Grandma Miller's idea. He's running a milling machine with a white shirt and a tie. I had never figured that one out. And this is my father at the tender age of about 92. He spent his entire life in medical research. And what I want you to do is look at this face and carry it with you into the trade show. God bless the trade show. That's why you can afford to come here and do what you're doing. And the majority of people in the trade show are honest people purveying to you things that they think are really good products. But this is the face of somebody who is a professional skeptic. Good-natured, but there is some skepticism in that expression. So when you go into the trade show, listen to what people have to say and buy their stuff so they'll support this wonderful conference. But then kind of step back and say, really? And that's what you need to think about when you hear the people talking about breakover. All right, what stimulated this whole process and getting a talk like this ready is a long process for me. It goes on over a period of months and years. And I keep turning it over and thinking about it and it keeps me awake at night. This was from the American Farrier's Journal. And it was an article on breakover. And the problem with the article was nobody ever defined what breakover was, and then they branched off in about five directions. So they were thinking about it and talking about it, and at the end of the article, I couldn't tell any more than I knew when I got started. So we're just doing our job the best we can. We're down there on the foot, trimming, trying to figure out the best shoe, looking to horse walk, doing our job the best we can. 
but we don't have much of a foundation to work with. It's a little bit rickety. There's not much theoretical foundation for what we're doing. So maybe we can improve on all that. Now, you went to fair your school, and they said, make sure you take care of the breakover. These firemen went to fireman school and said, make sure you take care of the hose and protect it from traffic. And they did. But they're ignoring the forces that the hose is exposed to. And if you think that this, I think very pictorially, I looked at this and I thought, this is ferry area here. We're off over at the fire truck and the real action is not where we are at all. All right, I'm going to use dressage as an example here because for my purposes, that's where the message is. And the reason is very simple. Of all the sport and performance horses, the dressage horse spends the maximum time with its feet on the ground. A puissance jumper doesn't spend a lot of time with the feet on the ground, important time. A thoroughbred racehorse for its work, doesn't spend a lot of time with its feet on the ground. The dressage horse spends a lot of time with the feet on the ground, and you can see what's going on with the dressage horse. And if you know a dressage, you will go out and work with them sometime, and just look at the horse traveling. You'll have a better idea what I mean. So this is a very complex chain of events. We're starting out with a thousand pound horse. And by the way, one of the big messages here we talk about breakover, and we're almost exclusively thinking of the front foot. Does the hind foot break over? I'm, I'm not sure. Randy Lukart's going to give you a wonderful talk on chewing the hind limb, and you'll begin to understand a lot better what's going on with the hind limb. But we tend to think of the front foot when we think of breakover. And that's the last thing that happens. So. There are a lot of other things going on with the horse, and that moment when the foot lifts off the ground is the end of a chain, and you, the tail can't wag the dog, and the shoe is not going to change that chain of events. I'll get into all of these things here. We are dealing with a fixed mechanical linkage. As Mitch just showed you, the coffin joint and the pasture joints have a certain amount of rotation and a certain amount of flexibility. But this is basically a fixed mechanical linkage, and the shoe cannot change that linkage. It's as simple as that. The horse has elastic soft tissues with help, which help propel the horse, balance the horse out in terms of shock absorption. And the other very important thing that we never even talk about, the horse has a nervous system, and in the field of animal biomechanics and locomotion studies, the issue of the central pattern generator has been more and more discussed, and I'll get into that as well. So we're going to cover a lot of things here today. So you're talking about breakover. Is it aware? Is it always over the lateral side of the toe? Is it in the center of the toe? Okay. Is it a particular location? Does it follow a particular path? In fact, it does not, and I'll show you the nice studies that Patrick Riley did with the uh, in-shoe force measurement systems. Does the hind foot break over the way the front foot does? Does it break over at all? We'll talk about it. Okay, is this a particular part of the gait cycle? Is it only after the horse reaches maximum forward reach or after the heel comes off the ground? Or is it does, that, does this phase of the gait start before the heel comes off the ground? I'm not sure. You can study, look at this with vectors and videography, and I'll show you some examples, and then you can decide. So do you think you can measure it? Can you go out and do something to a horse, put a rock or two shoe on the horse, and then tell me that you're going to measure it and show me the difference? At least on a treadmill, you can. I'll show you the study that talked about that. All right, so let's flip open the textbooks. Simon Kerr is a very smart man, wonderful, very interesting guy in one of his books. 
break over. Action of the point of hoof as it leaves the ground, point at which the foot leaves the ground. So Martin Deacon, and I'll get into this because this is wrong. Rotation of the heels around the toe at the end of the stance phase as though the foot has a hinge pin at the toe and it's hinging on the toe. I don't think that could be more wrong. Chris Gregory, because he's a very good politician. Last point of contact is the toe leaves ground, but a complex process. All right, so this was what I was talking about. And this is from Martin Deacon's uh, uh, book. And you can see that according to Martin Deacon, this toe is breaking over by pivoting on the ground. And so obviously, if the toe is longer or shorter, it's going to put less leverage on the foot. That might be the case if the toe has a hinge pin and it's stuck on the ground, but that's not really the way the horse moves. It's not a hinge motion. It's a lift and pivot motion most of the time. That combination of lift as well as moving forward over the toe is what's determining how that horse moves. It's not simply that the horse is planted and hinging forward. So the ground reaction force is not a hinge pin. And it's not, not that simple. But the lift is much more important than the pivot for almost all of the working gates of the horse, including most horses that walk. So we've got all these definitions. They're way too simple. No one agrees on what they are. There is no basis for comparative research because what I call breakover, or used to, and what Bob Smith calls breakover, and what Randy Lucart calls breakover, they're all different. So then we went out to the barn, did a horse, and came back and said, wow, this really improved the breakover. Except we weren't talking about the same thing. So <laughs> it's not helping. So what Mark Twain said about the weather, everybody talks about it, nobody does anything about it. There's breakover. All right, watch a professional golfer swing the golf club. If you believe that putting a shoe on a horse is going to change the breakover, then you probably believe that changing the grooves in the face of a golf club are going to make a drastic difference in the way that ball is hit at the end of the golf swing. Of course, you're ignoring the, the golfer's weight shift, the pivot, the whole sequence of events leading up to that because you believe that this appliance has some effect after a very complex chain of events. Baseball pitcher, all right. Baseball pitchers talk about gripping the ball parallel to the seams or cross seam, that they'll get different action out of the baseball, but it doesn't change the basic way they throw the baseball. This is at the end of a chain of events. Swinging a tennis racket the same way, and the human gait. And by the way, I'm not an emergency room physician. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and so I've spent my entire professional life, 43 years watching horses walk and move, and 33 years watching humans walk and move. It's what I do. And like all of you, I'm much better at thinking in terms of pictures than describing an action. And it's that way for all orthopedic surgeons, by the way. If you look in an orthopedic textbook, no one will do anything with it unless there are pictures. So it's not something, it's like anatomy. That's why Mitch's demonstrations are so important. You cannot read a description without the picture. It doesn't work. It won't work for any of you. You all know that. There are brilliant horseshoers who are dyslexic, and it doesn't matter because they're brilliant. All right. The late James Rooney had very a strong interest in uh, equine mechanics and anatomy. So if you look at a vector, what Rooney's talking about on this, this is the horizontal vector here. Sorry, I can't point in both directions. This is the motion of the foot forward relative to the horse's center of gravity. So the horse is reaching, reaching, reaches the maximum forward reach. The horizontal vector is now zero, and the center of gravity is now coming over the foot 
So the vector is coming back. Somewhere in here, I will grant you, is what you are thinking about as breakover. But I'm not going to pick out a point on the toe, and I'm not going to pick out a particular point in the gait cycle. But this area in here, if you want to think about it in terms of vectors, is most likely what you are thinking about as breakover. All right, so if we're doing this point of rotation thing, now the horse is in soft footing. So instead of that hinge pin that Martin Deacon was showing, all right, suppose the soil level is here and this is loose footing, like a nicely turned over racetrack. Well, it's not a hinge anymore. It's now a propeller. This, and you'll see it on high-speed videos all the time, this toe is actually taking dirt and sweeping it back. It's not just pivoting. It's taking the soil and throwing it back. That doesn't happen if the horse is simply moving forward like a pivot. And you can see it on all kinds of high-speed videos. So this is not it's not where it's at, as we used to say in the 70s. All right. This is one of the four or five things that you can control. Chris Pardo, who is a, now a PhD horseshoer, works with Renato Weller and Tilo Fowl, did a lot of work on ground surface interaction. And his conclusion, that sounds simple, but he spent a lot of time working on this. The horse's foot slides as it, as it impacts whatever surface it's working on. And it does that after the foot impacts and before it lifts off the ground. The slip dissipates energy for the horse. I think some of you have seen horses working with big studs where the horse lands and it's a sudden impact and the foot is, comes breaking suddenly. That's a huge shock to the horse's musculoskeletal system. The horse needs to slide a little bit but it needs enough grip to be able to do its work and go forward. And what Chris Pardo found was that excessive impact causes a lot of vibration in the limb, can lead to injury. And if the horse has too much grip built into the shoe, the horse will actually expend energy lifting off, holding back, in order to allow the foot to slide. So. This is one thing that we have a lot of control over, and the grip versus slip is part of the armament that we give that horse to do its job. And so if you look at this horse, and this is on basically on wet concrete or asphalt, the foot lands, slides just a little bit. Lands, slips a little, same thing with the hind foot. And this is a hard surface where there's a fair amount of grip, but that's what this horse is doing. The foot lands, and it slips just a little bit on the surface. And you'll see this repeatedly on videos. It appears on the high-speed videos and on the, some of the low-speed ones that I'll show you. The horse is almost reaching out, feeling its way with the foot. It's not just putting the foot down. You will see repeatedly that the horse will hold the foot in a certain posture as it's traveling, as it's shifting the center of gravity, and the horse, and I'll show you a really beautiful diagonal passage on a dressage horse, where the horse is loading medial lateral sides in order to anticipate the shift of the center of gravity, but the horse is actually feeling its way down. All right. This is something I got from Randy Lucard, and it's off one of his uh, videos that he gave me. And it appears that in a lot of cases, when the knee, the carpus, just begins to break over or flex or open up, this is what you could call the initiation of hoof enrollment, forward motion, what you used to call breakover, but you would never call again. And often this will happen before the heel lifts off. On, on this video, actually, occasionally the heel lifts just before the knee breaks. 
But this is a point of no return. Once the carpus, once the knee is flexed, the limb cannot bear weight. The horse is committed to going forward. Well, actually, that's in response to what's going on with the back of the horse. And part of our problem is we're thinking front, back, front, back, shoe a front pair, shoe a hind pair, shoe the front, trim the hind. And in fact, everything that's going on with the horse at all working gates is diagonal. And one of the things that I hope you'll take away from this, when you are analyzing a horse, stop looking at the front end and the back end and start looking at the diagonals. Because horses are not symmetrical. Some of the research that T.O. Fowl has done, uh, instrumenting horses, has really demonstrated this clearly. We all know horses, like people, tend to favor one side over the other. But horses do not have necessarily a symmetrical gait. And you need to look at the diagonals because that asymmetry comes out on the diagonal, not on the front and the hind and the front and the hind. This carpal flexion also occurs in response to the hawk and straightening out, what Mitch was talking about with the uh, reciprocal apparatus. All right, here's a horse on a treadmill. And treadmills, they're all right because you can look at the horse moving. And what you're seeing on this horse, I'll just play this again a few times. Clearly, this horse is doing what you would call winging in, and in fact, it's almost hitting itself, left side on the stationary right foot. But you'll also notice that on some of these strides, the opposite diagonal, the right hind and the left front, that left hind is coming way in. And it could be, and I haven't seen this horse move on dirt, I've never seen this horse live, it could be that this horse, you would be called to see this horse and asked to treat it for interference. And what in fact is going on is that the patient's left front is responding to a malposition or a bad function of a left hind because, or the right hind, because the right hind is in the wrong place. And what you really need to be doing is correcting that. So. There's a lot going on with these horses, but we're not seeing it because we're not concentrating on the diagonals. All right, the trot sequence, this is very important. And you can see the hind foot clearly comes up before the front foot. Really nice slow sequence here. Hind foot comes up, then, and then the front foot. Hind foot up, then front foot. And the hind end, the back of the horse, where all the power is, is driving the horse forward. We talk about a horse being like a wheelbarrow, but in fact, at a walk, and sometimes, depending on the horse at a trot, I like to think of the horse as being like a man on crutches. The hind legs are driving the horse forward, the forelimb the horse is actually vaulting over the front legs. A draft horse, which works heavily on the forehand, and you'll actually see lower its body and lean into the traces, is a little different situation. And at a walk, the horse is more or less vaulting over the front limb. At a trot, it's a little different. The other thing with this sequence, let me play it one more time here. The horse's center of gravity up here, the horse is compensating for that by bringing its diagonal in under the center of gravity, both sides. If you look at the diagonal and come straight up, the horse is positioning that diagonal so that it runs straight through the center of gravity. In James Rooney's book, he says the horse is like a table, a four-legged table, and it has to deal with the center of gravity being in the middle. The horse does a very nice job of that simply by doing, working on a diagonal, because if the horse's center of gravity is here, the center, that line of force goes from that foot to this one, straight through the center of gravity. That's what it's doing. That's how the horse compensates. All 
All right, this is what I was talking about. Uh, this is a wonderful passage here. Shows a lot of things. I'm afraid the magnification may not be quite enough. The horse is landing medial side on the right foot, the left foot, lateral side on the right front. And you will see, I'll play this multiple times, it's reaching way across with that hind limb, anticipating where the center of gravity is going to be. This horse is perfectly set up. Inside nostril is right over the inside shoulder. And you can see how still this rider is. He's giving him a leg aid, but it's very subtle. So this horse is doing a trotting diagonal passage, and it's compensating by foot position, medial, landing, lateral, hind limb back under the center of gravity, anticipating the motion in that direction. I think this is, this is an amazing passage if you watch this closely. And this horse clearly is well schooled, and this rider understands how to be quiet. So very subtle leg aid, medial, lateral foot plant there. Hind limb is coming in under the center of gravity because the horse is instinctively anticipating the motion in this direction. It's propelling itself diagonally as well as going forward by altering the position of its feet. But the head, neck, shoulder, center of gravity, and feet are all perfectly aligned. And the, the rider is just giving a little bit of a subtle leg aid right there. It's just a beautiful passage to me. It's, and it really illustrates what we're talking about because this horse is not breaking over a particular part of its foot as it works. It's altering the foot posture in order to compensate for what it's having to do. And the horse, of course, is not thinking about this at all. And I'll talk about why. All right. Patrick Riley did us all a great service by uh, developing this in-shoe force measurement system. And I think a lot of you have seen this. Uh, this is not a video, but at a walk, this horse landed, and the instrumentation's on the horse's right front. So the horse is landing a little bit lateral, and the line of force travels out through the toe. Very regular, very nice, very nice. So we're going to shoot this horse, and we'll say, so, all right, that line of force is going there. Let's put a rolled toe right there. Let's put a rocker toe there. That's where that horse is breaking over. It's simple. We've proved it, right? And then let's walk, work this horse. We're going to trot this horse now in a straight line. And look at how nice that is. And in this case, this horse seems to be loading. And you can see the direction of motion. This is hind front, hind front. This horse loads almost exactly where you would picture Duckett's dot being. And it's very nicely grouped lines of force. OK, roll toe, rocker toe, name your brand name. I won't pick them out here to embarrass any particular manufacturer right now. That solves all our problems. Unfortunately, horses don't work in straight lines. So here's a little more complicated path. And this is not a horse that's running barrels. It's just setting itself up for a jump. And now we've got lines of force, and this is the direction of motion, this way. So it's almost a scatter. Here's the toe. Horse lands. And there you are. So you've got, this is breakover. And this is not, as I said, this is not a particularly complicated uh, path that this horse is taking. It's going around a, a gentle curve and then setting up for a jump. So the idea that this is a fixed spot and a fixed place and fixed time in the gait pattern 
is probably not correct. And I can tell you, I put on thousands of rolled toe shoes and thousands of rocker toed shoes. And I was convinced I was just doing the greatest thing in the world. And the horsemen were happy, and so it was okay. So, almost all of the models that we've talked about in the past assume that the horse is traveling in a straight line. What do you do at a vet clinic? Trot the horse up, trot the horse back. Trot the horse up, trot the horse back. If you're lucky, you might be able to go out and watch the horse on the lunge line. So, if you're shooting a polo horse, Steve Krause can tell you what a polo horse does for a living, and it's not in a straight line. And so the load on that horse is completely different from what you were trying to observe at the vet clinic. And what about the footing? And this is a problem for uh, rainers, and it's a problem for ropers. They go from one arena to the next in their competitions, and the footing changes. And their shoes are set up for a particular type of footing, and it just doesn't work out quite as well because of what Chris Pardo was talking about, grip versus slip. You've adjusted perfectly for a particular arena, a particular discipline, and then the horse goes out to a big competition and the arena is crushed stone and old tires. I think Bob Pethick had a picture of that and, that I got from him. It just ate up the feet. All right, so the horse is living on a diagonal. Watch a speed skater sometime. Humans, because we have two legs, if you want to go someplace, we don't walk one foot in front of the other, right? We take a step. We take a step this way, we take a step that way. We have a diagonal gait. Part of the compensation for that is as you walk, your pelvis pivots at the hips. So as I take a step, my pelvis is twisting to accommodate that bringing my legs closer into the center of gravity. Well, that's what the horse does. The horse is like a speed skater, except that that diagonal is now on four feet, and that keeps the center of gravity where the horse can still manage it. And as James Rooney said, the center of mass is relatively far from the horse's feet, so the horse positions those feet to be able to deal with that. The tendency in the horse is that as a horse is moving because of the diagonal, because of the line from the horse's hind limb to the, through the center mass to the forelimb, that it will go out the medial side of the hind foot and the lateral side of the front foot. And you'll see this pretty persistently in shoe wear, and you'll see it pretty persistently in hoof growth. And uh, Robbie Hunziker and uh, Steve Sermersheimer here, and they've done a lot of work looking at hind feet as well and ask them about this, the kind of hypertrophy that you see on the medial side of the toe of a hind foot on a lot of sport horses. So that's the tendency of that line of force because the horse is working and living on a diagonal. None of the textbooks that I have looked in really talk about diagonal pairs. If you look at standard textbooks, it's almost all about front feet, hind feet, front foot, hind limb. Let's dissect the front limb, let's shoe the front foot, let's dissect the hind limb, let's shoe the hind limb. And you've got to begin thinking about it's not a front and back horse. It's a right diagonal, left diagonal horse. So if you actually assume that those hind and opposite forelimbs are working together, you'll get a lot further along. This is a great book if you, you can get it off Amazon uh, by Nancy Nicholson. It's called Biomechanical Writing. It's a, it's a big format, loose leaf color book. And she goes into the gait patterns of the horse, and I won't belabor this particular one, but there's a great deal in her book about how the horse is dealing with the ground forces and living on the diagonal, and it's, it's worth your time to look at it. All right. This is the hind or the pelvic limb of the horse. This is the motor. This is what the front limb is dealing with and responding to. And what is happening is that, at least in other than a walking gait, 
you can see the hip joint is going up and down, up and down because of what Mitch was talking about. Elastic tissues, muscle, and changes in posture. And what this does is to load the horse up. So what you have to think of, as you go from a walk to a trot, you're going from a walk to a pogo stick. The back end of the horse is functioning like a pogo stick. And the front limb is responding to that. So when the horse is walking, it's more or less vaulting over the limb. There's not a lot of energy stored up or released. And Nancy Nicholson calls this an inverted pendulum. I would just say it's, it's similar also to a, a pole vaulter's pole. It's planted, the load goes forward. But at a trot or anything more than a walk, there is elastic recoil built into this system with the result that, and I've drawn a line across the screen here so that you can orient yourself, and I'll play this a couple of times. This is why riders have to post, because the animal is moving up and down a lot. And that's not just for fun, that's elastic storage. See how far down the horse comes here? And then up, I'll play this one more time how far down it descends, and then up. And a lot of this has to do with energy storage. So the trot is a pure diagonal gait. The walk is a sequential diagonal gait. But the mechanics of these are completely different. So again, you have to think about these things because we've so focused on what we're going to do to the front foot to enhance this horse that we've kind of lost sight of the fact that this is not where the action is. Now, just to cement this in your minds, the people who do locomotion and biomechanics studies, the gait cycle starts with the left hind limb. That's the convention. So if you're studying gait or locomotion analysis, doing locomotion analysis, the gait cycle starts on the left hind limb, not in the front. And when you're looking at this drawing, the sequence of these illustrations is that way. That's why I put the arrow up here. So the understanding is that the motor is in the back and the uh, forelimb has to respond to this. We tend to treat it like we're going to shoot the front of the horse and the back of the horse and not make much of a connection there until or unless the horse is overreaching or forging. Then we start thinking about it. To oversimplify it, the hind limb is driving the horse and the front limb is responding to the hind limb on a diagonal. And I'm not talking about breakover. All right. Now let's get into a little bit more interesting stuff here. The horse's gait is, a, is like your, your signature that you sign on your tax return or your bank statement. And I can ask you to sign it. And then if I ask you in the privacy of your own hotel room, go in, take off your shoes and socks, put the pen between your toes, and write your name. It'll look just the same. Because you're not making your signature with your hand. You're making your signature with your brain and the reflexes in your spinal cord and your cerebellum and the rest of your body. You're not signing with your hand. You're signing with your nervous system. That's what the horse has. You can do whatever you want to. That gait is part of the horse's nervous system and brain. And this, what you're talking about as breakover, is a built-in issue for the horse. OK, so let's talk about this thing, central pattern generator. And this is really interesting. I might be getting a little far afield in the next couple of slides, but you'll bear with me, right? So. The central pattern generator, and this is in locomotion studies, and the person that can probably talk to you about this more is uh, Renato Weller or, or Tilo, and you can ask them about it. It's basically a multiple level, multi-level series of reflexes within the spinal cord, and probably gets up as far as the lower part of the brain, what's called 
brainstem, midbrain, or the cerebellum, which is the part of your brain in the back of your head here that mostly governs your coordination, but you don't do any thinking with it. So this central pattern gener exhibits what are called rhythmic flexor extensor excitation inhibition. What that means is the horse is moving forward, and as it wants to extend the limb, it's going to inhibit the flexors, stimulate the flexors, and as it reaches an endpoint, it's going to do the same thing on the other side. And this is a rhythmic firing of the nervous system, and the horse isn't ever thinking about this. This is how you walk, too. You don't think about, all right, I'm going to walk down the street, I'm going to put my heel down, my toe, and then I'm going to pivot my pelvis forward, and then this is all somewhere in here. So, to me, what we call the rider's aids, it's really stimulating the central pattern generator reflexes. And the riders that can get a horse to relax are the ones that are quiet on the horse and have figured out where the buttons are for that particular horse's central pattern generator. This is a very interesting field. And the central pattern generators have been studied in a lot of different animals, more in lower level creatures like lampreys, but I think you will be seeing a lot more of this. And it doesn't have a lot to do with the rocker toe shoe, just to remind, remind you why I'm getting off the, into this. Okay, a kangaroo does not have a central pattern generator set to move its hind legs separately. It can't do it. A kangaroo has been a very successful animal overall for something that looks really bizarre. It can't move its hind legs separately. It does not have the nervous system capability to do that. And a Shetland pony cannot do a running walk, no matter how you shoe it. Okay. Shetland Pony can't rack, and even if Randy Lucart's shoeing it, it still won't rack. All right, ostriches, they've got central pattern generators, and Dr. Weller has had the pleasure of putting these on a treadmill, and you can ask her about that experience, because these are not very agreeable creatures. And if you think we've got a problem dealing with a horse's foot how about this? And this ostrich can run 30 miles an hour. And it sure isn't thinking about it. It's all in the central pattern generator. All right, so I'm gonna get a little bit far afield here, but just to wake you up. How many here have heard of Mike the Headless Rooster? Good, all right, so I'm not that far out here. Well, Mike the Headless Rooster, his owner, I don't know if it was his mother-in-law or his wife, like, liked chicken neck. So he went out to chop Mike's head off one day to make chicken. And he tried to make sure that he got far enough up to the head to maximize the amount of neck on the chicken. And of course, the chicken dropped over on the ground. But then the chicken got up and started running around with no head. And the claim is that this is, the claim is, and this is the guy that was exhibiting Mike, making $4,500 a month, that that was Mike's head in the jar. Actually, it's not. Mike's head was carried off by the family cat, and they chopped off another chicken's head and put it in the jar, just to make it look authentic. He was kept alive for about 18 months by being fed with a dropper down his gullet, and walked around doing just fine, with no head, because his central pattern generators were up to the job. So, lost his head, but he kept his central pattern generators going. And there you are. Okay. And if that's not enough, let's talk about Leonardo Fibonacci. Anybody ever hear of him? Yeah, a few people. Good. Very good. Okay. Mathematician in the 1200s in Italy. Probably did a lot of his family were merchants. He traveled probably uh, uh, to uh, 
Arabia and brought back the zero. And before the zero, we're in the Roman numeral system. What's the Roman numeral system? It's counting with your fingers. Five, 10. That's the V and the X, right? Okay, so, so what? Well, without the zero, you can't pro develop the Fibonacci sequence. And the Fibonacci sequence is really simple, but you have to have a zero. You add two numbers together to get the next number. So zero plus one is one. One plus one is two, right? One plus two is three, and so on. If you map that as an arc, this is what you wind up with. It's called a Fibonacci spiral. And it's everywhere. This is the mapping of the Fibonacci sequence. And the thing that I think is really interesting about this, this is a chamomile flower, and that's a nautilus shell. This is a perfect Fibonacci spiral. Well then, a really smart hand surgeon I know pointed out something. And the same thing, this is the same as the golden proportion of the Greeks. They didn't know about Fibonacci, but they just kind of figured this out. So, this hand surgeon, he's gone now, his name is J.L. Littler. Heard about Fibonacci, and he looked at a human finger, and he said, gee, this is a fixed mechanical linkage, and it pretty much moves along the line of a Fibonacci spiral. It's not perfect. And I think it's the ring or long finger does it the best, but it's pretty close. So, so what? Okay. What is this thing that Mitch Taylor was working on? It's a distal, middle, and proximal phalanx. And although there are limitations of, of motion in those joints, the horse's limb is pr coming pretty close to a Fibonacci spiral. Well, I got to thinking about this. And if you are putting a flat shoe on a horse and the horse is able to go forward, you're pretty much working at the end of the Fibonacci spiral. But suppose you're shoeing gator horses and you put a three inch stack of pads under the heel, you're probably moving the point at which the spiral starts back to here. So really what we're doing with these shoes, instead of enhancing breakover, and this, is, this occurred to me today, so forgive me if I'm wrong, because I certainly could be. One of the things that we can do as farriers is to accentuate which part of the Fibonacci spiral we're going to bring out for this horse. So if you shoe a walking horse flat with a big shoe, you're going to have more forward reach and a lazier arc. And if you shoe a horse with a stack of pads and heel weights, you will exaggerate the lift and the tight part of the, the spiral here. It might be that just occurred to me today. It's one of the things that farriers can control, though, which part of the Fibonacci spiral that the foot is generally describing, what, which part are we going to accentuate? And if you have the skill to do that, then you're going to be a successful gated shoer. OK, so we're working at the end of a complex chain of events. We really can't affect the gait pattern a great deal, except in extreme cases and on gated horses. And I was lucky after I finished Cal Poly Horseshoeing School at the end of 69, I worked with a master craftsman named Robert J. Sherrill, who was a uh, Tennessee walking horse and five gated horseshoe. And uh, he could affect a horse's gait, but as I understand it now, that's probably what he was doing. He was able to look at the horse and decide which part of that arc, which part of the sequence he was going to be able to accentuate. And he had the skill to do it. And of course, he made all of the shoes. So he could tailor them to each one. So. What happens if we've measured the results? And I'll show you some of that. All right. 
customer comes to you, my horse just isn't working right. Can you shoe, put a shoe on to fix it? Well, this, horse, this is a beautifully collected horse, right? Inside nose over the inside shoulder, nicely flexible, bending here, bending the other way, looking great, okay? This is a horse that is actually traveling to the right, but it doesn't bend, and actually the head is going in the wrong way, and the hind limb is way out of position here. This is an immature horse that is not halfway collected, and the owner comes to you and says, gee, can you, can you change the brake over to make them work better? And the answer is, hell no, I can't. <laughs> All right, one of my favorite papers, and I said, this is a treadmill study. I found this when I was working on the, the, uh, the uh, barefoot horse trimming book. Take a group of young Dutch warm blood horses. They've never had shoes on. Okay, we trim them flat, put them on a treadmill, put a flat shoe on the young Dutch warm blood horses, put them back on the treadmill, take the shoes off, put a typical heavily rolled Dutch warm blood shoe and put them back on the treadmill. And we take high speed videos and time them. And you know what happens? Nothing. <laughs> it had zero measurable effect. That was in 1997. Nobody has refuted this study to my knowledge, but I'm not, I don't know the orthopedic literature the way a lot of folks do here. So, you're going to read studies. They say we have a p-value in this study, a probability value that there was a difference between this group of horses and this group of horses, and we have the same thing in human medicine. Yes, there was a statistical difference, and it made absolutely no difference between this group of horses and this group of horses or this group of patients and this group of patients. So the actual on the ground that you're, effect that you're getting may or may not relate to a, an effect that you see in an engineering laboratory. So we've got really good tools. Scott Lampert and others who pioneered the high-speed videography have done a huge service to us. Patrick Riley's work you've already seen. And most of the front footage studies are showing lateral walk landing, but more medial load at trot or canter. So that's what we've learned from some of these studies. Okay. So you have to know your limitations, and you also have to think on the diagonal. Our job is to keep the foot healthy and assist the horse in its work. But I think we have to recognize that a lot of the shoes, and you see, uh, and Frank has uh, Russell's scientific horseshoeing book out there, it's worth owning it just to look at all the bizarre shoes in there. And when I looked at those and then started looking at some of the horses that I've taken care of, this is an example. And this is not the horse just standing with this. This is the horse's limb. That's how this horse is made. She's 24 years old, and she is lame without a compensatory shoe put on. And this is at the end of a, a shoeing cycle. Okay. So... The problem that this horse has and, and an in-towing horse has, the axis of motion of these joints is in this direction, but the horse has to move this way. So the horse is putting an asymmetrical load on, on there, and it's not a congruent load on the joint. So what can you do about it? Well, of course, being a well-trained horseshoer, I put on a diagonal breakover shoe. And it really dramatically straightens out the foot, but that's not why. The reason it straightens out the foot is that I trim the foot properly, and also the way that the shoe was built, the lateral heel is built up. So really what I've done with the shoe, to me, this part of the toe, it's an afterthought. I've derotated the foot. So now the horse can move forward 
with the same axis of motion that the joints have. That's why the horse feels better. That diagonal break, the, it's nice to make one. I, I like doing it with my hammer. The reason I think this foot, and I, I, it's only taken me about 10 years to figure this one out. The reason the horse felt better is I trimmed the foot properly and built up the, 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 knee, the lateral heel. And it derotated the foot. So message done from this is, look at Russell's book. Let him talk about trotting horses. You can work on slip versus grip. You can, by derotating the foot with whatever these appliances, out, outriggers are, you can change the rotational position of the foot, either coming off the ground or landing or static on the ground. So you, by correcting rotation, you can get the joints aligned to where they are flexing and extending in the axis which they were designed to do. You have control over that. And remember, the horse really needs its toes. All these rocker toes, natural balance, radical setback, shoes, rail shoes, rocker, rocker shoes. One out of a thousand horses might, might need those. A really bad ring bone horse that just needs it to walk around. Or you're substituting the shoe for a joint. But most of the time, uh, these things are, we're addressing a problem that is coming from someplace else. So you're going to spend all your time now evaluating the back of the horse as much as the front and more, and then concentrating on the diagonals. You can't control an out of condition rider, out of condition horse, poor balance, and you're asked to do this every day. My horse just isn't working right. Can you put the shoes on? No. Okay. Um, all right. So what's the ultimate goal? As usual, Duckett on most things had it pretty much right. Joint congruency under load. And you do that by getting the foot in a better position, as I've told you. And in order to help you understand this, I'll show you one more slide. This is a human, of course. One of my human patients. And this is an individual who is wearing out the medial side of his knee. You can see the space here is bigger than this space. So this is not a congruent joint. What I was able to do for this individual is to cut a wedge of bone out here and make him slightly more knock-kneed so that the space here and the space here are a little more even. And we can't do that as farriers. So we have to use all the other tricks that we have. Trimming, building the shoe, adjusting the shoe, so that we can have a congruent, congruently loaded joint. So I think I'm going to just stop with that, see if there are any questions. But I hope uh, you got something out of this. And maybe it will stimulate you never to use the term breakover again ever in your life. Thank you.